Hello, I'm Paolo Cavaliere and I'm trying to offer a quick overview of freedom of speech as a principle protected at international level. The reason why we nowadays consider freedom of speech to be one of the most universal legal principles in the, in the world is not only because it's protected in almost every national constitution all over the world, but also because there are a number of international conventions protecting it at international level. When we think of the protection of freedom of speech at national level, the historically most relevant examples come from the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen from 1789 and the First Amendment to the United States Constitution from 1791. These two provisions paved the way for freedom of speech to be broadly acknowledged in almost all of the national constitutions that we have nowadays on comparative perspective. But it was before the end of the Second World War that freedom of speech made its way to the international level. The first notable example in this sense comes from the United Nations Human Rights Commission that in 1946 started its work to prepare an international bill of human rights. The results of these efforts consist of two legal documents. One of them is provided with legally binding force and the other one doesn't have such a similar legally binding force. The first is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As I was saying, it doesn't have a binding force, but nevertheless, it's been inspirational for a number of uh, other conventions that followed in the next years and um, has influenced the appreciation and the protection of this right at global level. If you look at the wording of the provision, you can find how comprehensive it is it offers protection to free speech in every possible field and for every possible kind of content. Nevertheless, the way in which the right is framed means that it's not absolute, but it can be balanced with other relevant interests and rights, and uh, so it is possible to suffer limitation in some specific cases. The second result of the meetings of the UN Human Rights Commission was the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This time we are dealing with an instrument provided with legally binding force. That means that it's being enforced in all of the countries that signed and ratified the international instrument. It is also similarly quite wide in its content and it also protects the passive layer of freedom of information. That means it also protects the right of people to actively seek and receive information. It is also similarly absolute in the sense that it doesn't allow interferences with expression of thoughts and opinions but it carries also some responsibilities for the speaker. It means that in this case the right is being balanced with other fundamental principles that are similarly vested in the relevant document. Uh, therefore, the exercise of freedom of expression can be subject to restrictions when necessary, either to respect the right and reputations of others or for the protection of national security and public order. This and similar cases of public interests can offer a suitable ground for the limitation of the individual freedom of speech. Another notable uh, peculiarity of this provision is that it also offers, for the first time, a limited system for hearing complaints. Uh, the, the International Covenant, in fact, comes with an optional and additional protocol that countries are free to sign and when doing so, they will also enable a redress system for citizens that feel like having had the rights 
violated by a public authority or by some fellow citizen. These two provisions, although have some significant differences one from another, are both universal in the sense that they are not meant to be limited to some geographically restricted area, but can be signed and ratified by any country in the world that is part of the UN. Along with these two instruments, there are also a number of other international conventions that are not as universal in their inspiration, but are supposed to be applied only in some specifically limited geographic areas. A first example would be, for instance, the European Convention on Human Rights from 1948. It has one of the broadest provisions for the protection of human rights, but also, in the second paragraph, it also comes with one of the longest lists of limitations that member states can provide in order to secure competing interests and possibly limiting uh, freedom of expression in this way. Uh, interests that can operate as counterbalancing freedom of speech can include national security, territorial integrity or public safety, for instance. Despite this long list of limitations, the European Convention on Human Rights is traditionally considered as one of the most successful instruments in protecting freedom of speech at international level. The main reason for that is probably in the particularly efficient system for address that the Convention uh, provides. Individuals have a right to file petitions to the Commission for alleged violations of their right to freedom of speech. And there's also an international court, the European Court of Human Rights, that can receive complaints for the breach of these and similar rights. There's a second convention for freedom of speech uh, that is provided in Europe. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. The two conventions must not be confused. Uh, they come with different international instruments and they are applied in different scopes. The European Convention of Human Rights has, in fact, 47 states that have ratified it, while the scope of the European Charter is way, way narrower, has at present state it only has 27 member states. Nevertheless, the provision is quite similar because the European Charter has been drafted on the example of the European Convention. You can see how the first paragraph reads exactly the same and then the second paragraph, instead of having the long list of limitations that the European Convention has, appear to protect further layers of freedom of speech, namely freedom of the media and the value of pluralism. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, similar to the European Convention on Human Rights, provides for a mechanism for judicial redress. On a completely different geographical level, there's the American Convention on Human Rights, the wording of this provision is almost identical to the International Covenant, which has been the example on which this provision has been drafted. It also prohibits indirect methods of restricting expression, and it also contains explicit positive requirements for the member states that have to prohibit cases of war propaganda, uh, racial or religious hatred. This is the first example that we're finding now of a provision of this fashion that uh, instead of just keeping governments to keep their hands off freedom of speech, it's also required them to take positive measures to protect interests that can be violated through an unduly exercise of this right. Another example comes from Africa where the African Charter of Human 
and People's Rights has been passed in 1986. It's probably the shortest provision that we have found so far. Uh, but it also needs to be coupled with some general restrictions that can be found somewhere else in the same document that, uh, that call for any right protected in this convention to be balanced with public interests or more general interests, like for instance, the rights of other, collective security, morality and common interest. Uh, this particular convention uh, is traditionally considered not to have proved particularly successful, mostly because it almost didn't provide any mechanism for redress. There was a commission that could investigate cases of breach of fundamental rights, but it was usually affected by poor transparency and in any case it didn't offer all of the um, fair trial guarantees that proper courts tend to offer. A dedicated court was established in 2004, but so far it has improved successful um, similarly to the past um, commission. So we have seen how, this, how all of these uh, international instruments can operate at different levels, they can be geographically limited or they can be universal in their inspiration. They also come many times with similar uh, wordings because especially the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has been inspirational for all of the following instruments. Uh, the way in which they operate in offering protection for freedom of speech at international and also at national level is by making a member state that signed and ratified the convention obliged to do different kinds of um, performances. First, the member state traditionally has an obligation to adopt, the local, to adopt the local legislation in order to meet the requirement and the expectations of the, of the relevant international convention. The second, re the second requirement is to provide for some sort of remedies, um, possibly judicial remedies, for cases of alleged violations of the relevant rights. And we have seen that it's not always the case for all of these conventions. I hope this quick overview will be helpful and I wish you the best of luck in your moot court.